A reading from the book of Genesis. Jacob prayed, O God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, O Lord, who said to me, Return to your country and to your kindred, and I will do you good. I am not worthy of the least of all the steadfast love and all the faithfulness that you have shown to your servant. For with only my staff I crossed this Jordan, and now I have become two companies. Deliver me, please, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I am afraid of him. He may come and kill us all, the mothers and the children. Yet you have said, I will surely do you good and make your offspring as the sand of the sea, which cannot be counted because of their number. So he spent that night there, and from what he had with him, he took a present for his brother Esau. The same night he got up and took his two wives, his two maids, and his eleven children, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream, and likewise everything that he had. Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he struck him on the hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, Let me go, for the day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, What is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then the man said, You shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with humans and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, Please tell me your name. But he said, Why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life is preserved. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. The Lord be with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Then Jesus and his disciples went to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. He took with him Peter and James and John and began to be distressed and agitated and said to them, I am deeply grieved, even to death. Remain here and keep awake. And going a little farther, he withdrew himself, he threw himself on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. He said, Abba, Father, For you all things are possible. Remove this cup from me. Yet not what I want, but what you want. The Gospel of Christ. When we started working our way through the narrative lectionary a year ago, on one of those first Sundays and then a couple other sermons from time to time, I made the point that there are often several different ways to interpret what the scriptures are saying that there can be a range of interpretation, understanding a passage to mean this, or perhaps this, or perhaps this over here. And oftentimes those interpretations can come across a little bit differently. But I encouraged us to keep in mind that they are nevertheless an honest attempt to understand what a particular passage means for us. Today, our first reading from Genesis chapter 32 is one of those passages that provides a great example of this variety of interpretation. And so this morning, what we want to do is look at three possibilities of how we might interpret this and explain as much as we can in the time we have why each one of these views would make some good sense. We have to begin, though, with a little bit of background story because just picking up this episode where it is now, if you don't know the background, it makes it kind of hard to catch the vision of what's happening. So we are reading about Jacob. The three great patriarchs of Israel are Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Jacob is the one that we're learning about today. He was born to Isaac as a twin brother. His brother Esau is technically the oldest because when they were born, Esau came out first, and the scriptures tell us that Jacob was grasping his heel on his way out of the birth canal. And so Jacob actually means heel grabber, but that has become a euphemism for deceiver. So that's the name that Jacob has grown up with, and it turns out that's how his life tended to be characterized. 
Uh, that's what his life was characterized by, this idea of deception. We see this fairly early in the story because as the two boys grow up, we find out that they were quite different people. Esau grew up to be, you know, a man's man. He was pretty hairy, he liked hunting, he probably had a four by four camel, and his dad favored Esau. On the other hand, Jacob was quite the opposite. Jacob was like me, um, a little bit more slender, maybe he liked reading. He was called a smooth man in the King James Version of the Bible, and he liked hanging out with his mom learning how to cook, unlike me. Uh, but nevertheless, he was favored by Rebecca, his mom. Esau was favored by his dad, Isaac. Well, time goes on for a little while, and Esau was out hunting, and he's coming back, and he's just famished. He's been out for quite some time, and he comes across Jacob, who's trying out a new stew recipe, and he sees Jacob, and he says, oh, man, give me some of that stew. I'm starving. And Jacob's thinking, yeah, I could give you some of this stew if you uh, sell your birthright to me. The whole point about the birthright is whoever was the firstborn son is the one who got the lion's share of the inheritance and everything. And so Jacob is saying, yeah, you can have some of this too. Just give me your birthright. And Esau's going, oh, man, I'm starving now. Who cares about my birthright? Sure, it's yours, whatever. Just give me that stew. Nom, 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 nom. And away we go. Well, Jacob evidently told his mom about this and they never forgot about it because several years later, Isaac is now very, very old. He's blind and he knows he's at the brink of death. So he says to Esau, Esau, I am old, I am blind, I'm at the very brink of death, and I want you to go out and hunt for me some game and prepare it for me the way that you know I like it. Bring it to me, we'll have a meal together, and then I'll give you the blessing as the firstborn. And so Esau goes off to do that. He's out the door, Rebekah notices this, calls to Jacob and says, hey Jacob, here's your chance. Let me go ahead and prepare something for Isaac that he know he'll like. I want you to go into Esau's room, put on some of his clothes, put on some of his aftershave and stuff, and basically we're going to pull a fast one on your dad. And so he gi she gives the food to uh, uh, Jacob, who's dressed up as Esau and smells like Esau. And he comes in and he says, hey, dad, it's me, Esau. I'm here with the meal you asked for. And Isaac's going... You sound a lot like Jacob. No, seriously, I'm, I'm Esau. Like, touch me, smell me. It's, it's me. I'm your son, right? And Isaac goes, okay, I mean, sounds a lot like Jacob, but I believe you that it's Esau. So he eats the food and then asks Esau to come and receive the blessing. And Isaac gives him a blessing, which talks about, you know, how great he's going to be and how wonderful life is going to be. And he's going to have a lot of descendants and he's going to prosper in all these great things. And then Jacob leaves. No sooner does he leave then the real Esau comes in with the food he prepared and says, hey, dad, it's me. I'm here. I brought the food. And Isaac's going, who is this now? I'm Esau, your firstborn son. Well, that can't be because I just blessed Esau. And Esau's going, no, it, it really is me. Like, what has happened here? And they realize that Jacob had pulled this fast one. So now Esau is despondent and says, dad, haven't you got a blessing for me? And he says, no, I've already given that blessing. Well, there's got to be something you can give me. And so then um, Isaac blesses Esau. Well, blesses. He basically says, yeah, you're going to live in the wilderness your whole life. You will live by the sword and you will always be a servant to your brother. And that's all Esau gets out of it. So now it's understandable that Esau is supremely ticked off and he wants to kill Jacob now. Rebecca, of course, the mom, the innocent party in all of this, uh, has heard this story and rushes off to tell Jacob, Jacob, you got to get out of here because Esau wants to kill you. So go back, head east to our homeland, to where our ancestors lived, and stay out there until Esau cools off. So Jacob packs up a bunch of stuff and heads out and goes east. He ends up spending 20 years out there. He gets married to two women and has two concubines. And with these four women, has 11 kids, which is a story in itself. But he also becomes quite prosperous, pulls a fast one several times on his father-in-law Laban. But now he's on his way back to the promised land. And he's going to have to meet Esau again. And this is where we pick up the reading from this morning. Jacob isn't sure where Esau's at. Has he forgiven? Is he still got a vendetta against me? And so he makes these preparations to try to satisfy uh, Esau and win him over, but he's afraid. And so he prays. And that's what we first heard Susan read this morning. Jacob prays, basically saying, God, I'm scared. I have no idea what Esau's going Esau's to do. I think he might still want to kill me and all my kids and my wives. Please let it be that I can be spared. And besides, you had promised that I would flourish. 
And so he makes that prayer, then sends all of his possessions and his wives and kids over this river, the Jabbok River, and he's by himself on this side. And then it says that he wrestled with a man all night. And this man wrestling with him found out he could not prevail against Jacob. And so he struck Jacob on the hip, which dislocated his hip. And now Jacob walks with a limp the rest of his life. But Jacob holds on to him and says, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And so the man says, okay, what's your name? Jacob. Okay, your name isn't Jacob anymore, but it will be Israel. Because you have striven with both God and humans and have prevailed. And so from there... Jacob then receives this blessing. He calls the place Peniel, which means the face of God, because he declares, I have seen the face of God and have lived. So the implication is that he, he had wrestled with some kind of divine being. If you see a picture of this, it's usually he's wrestling with an angel, right? It doesn't say angel in there, but that's one of the possibilities. But anyway, that's the episode. Just to finish the story, he does go across the river the next day and meets Esau, and Esau is happy to say, hey, look, no big deal, water under the bridge, take it easy, I'm doing great, you're doing great, that's all I care about, and life is good. So Esau doesn't try to kill him. All right, so we've read this passage. And now, because they're part of the Christian scriptures, the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, is nevertheless part of the Bible as a whole that we as Christians pay attention to tend to want to ask ourselves the question, what do we do with this story? <clears throat> is there a lesson here for us to learn? And part of the reason why we even ask that question, is there a lesson here for us, is because that is what early Christians began to conclude about the Hebrew Bible. In uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, the Apostle Paul makes this point, speaking about Israel. He said, these things happened to them to serve as an example, and they were written down to instruct us on whom the ends of the ages have come. So from Paul's perspective, everything we read in this part of the Bible is written with an intention of giving us a lesson of some kind. And so if we take that approach, if we think, okay, there's a lesson here, if we're going to say this is the word of God... Uh, if we're going to see that the Bible is really sacred and important in that way, okay, what's the lesson we draw from this? Well, the easiest way would be to simply take it at face value and look at what happened and go, okay, this is our lesson. What do we learn? Two things, I would suggest. The first, Jacob was very, very afraid. He was afraid of Esau. He was afraid of his life. And so in the face of his fear, what did Jacob do? He prayed. He asked God for help. He asked God for deliverance. He asked God that he would be able to face Esau. So there's one thing. When you are in the face of fear, go ahead and pray. Talk to God about it. Ask God for help. The second thing is when he was wrestling with the man all night long, is as he was wrestling, he had the understanding that this must have been something more than simply a man, that this was indeed a divine being of some sort. <clears throat> Because he sees fit to say, look, I am not going to let you go unless you bless me. There's just something a little bit more than thinking he's just wrestling some other guy. And so he's got this idea that he's engaged with the divine. You could say that he is wrestling with God. And he says, I am not going to let you go unless you bless me. And how this can be taken is this idea that is sometimes talked about. You might hear the idea of wrestling in prayer. Or an older way of putting it is travailing in prayer. You're doing the hard work of prayer. In my Pentecostal upbringing, one of the older ways this would be described is that you had to pray through. The idea was that if you had a prayer request, somebody you're concerned about, whatever circumstance you're facing, you go to prayer and you continue to pray and pray and pray until you feel that there's some kind of breakthrough, something in your spirit tells you that, okay, it's being handled now, or something like that. You wrestle in prayer until you come to that resolution. And that interpretation is what I would suggest those who constructed the narrative lectionary are thinking, because they gave us as the gospel reading to go with this, Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane wrestling in prayer. He's, he's there the night before his crucifixion, and he's going, oh God, you, you, you can do everything, and if it's possible, please take this cup from me. Don't, don't let me have to be crucified tomorrow. <sighs> Nevertheless, not what I want, what you want. And we see in that example of Jesus, this idea of wrestling in prayer and praying through to come to that conclusion. 
So that is one interpretation of this passage. Take it at face value, take it as a lesson, derive lessons from it, and we have two really good things that we can work with. Absolutely, 100%, no problem. Now, a second interpretation involves taking a closer look at why this book was written in the first place, why the book of Genesis was written, why this story was told. And we're reminded, as you've heard me say a few times before already, that the Hebrew Bible began to be composed about 1000 BCE when Israel was established as a kingdom. They now have rest from war. They're at peace. They've got this great tract of land that is all theirs. They're united under a king, and now they can tell their story. They can tell their people, the people of the kingdom, here's where you came from. Here's who you are. Here's who Yahweh your God is and how we're supposed to respond to our God. And so this story of one of their great patriarchs is told, and it tells them how they got their name. Your name shall be not Jacob anymore, but now Israel. And because they're all descended from Jacob slash Israel, that is now their name. But also an important piece of what their ancestor did. In his prayer to God when he was afraid of Esau, he went to God and said, I'm afraid he might kill me. And yet you have promised that I would be someone with many descendants, that I would be a great nation, that there would be this tremendous lineage. Your promise was that we would be preserved and a nation would result from my faithfulness to you and my children. And of course, Jacob slash Israel became the father of 12 kids ultimately, who all were the fathers of each of the tribes of Israel. And the nation of Israel existed as a kingdom when this was written because Jacob said to God, this is what you promised. I'm counting on that promise. I am relying on that promise. And that promise came to be true. So here, the lesson we could take from that is to say, look, if God makes a promise, God's going to be good to fulfill that promise. And one can approach God on the basis of God's promises and say, this is what I am counting on. This is why I am remaining faithful and standing firm, because you have promised that this would be so. And the promise is that God would fulfill that promise. Now, there is a complication here. It seems that in the Hebrew Bible, all sorts of people could hear God audibly really easily, whereas we tend not to have that experience these days. And so it might be that we might be convinced that God is promising this thing like right here, but if we happen to be wrong and God's promising that, we're going to have a crisis of faith pretty fast. So just saying, we, we, that's, a, that's a complication about this. But nevertheless, that would be a valid lesson, a second interpretation from this passage based on the reason why this was written for the kingdom of Israel. Now, the third interpretation is a little bit more challenging to grasp, but it really begins to move away from just thinking that this is indeed the word of God in a sacred way, but it is certainly something that we could say was inspired by God to be written by these human beings 3,000 years ago with a purpose to make a point about their uh, origin, about who they are as a people and who their God is. And so in that sense, what we would see here is when this started to be written 3,000 years ago, the people of Israel, the kingdom of Israel, needed to know who they were. And so a story is told about their ancestors to illustrate clearly what kind of people they ought to be and, by extension, what kind of people they ought not to be. And the way they do this is by creating a story to illustrate this point. It's like telling a parable, or to use other language, to tell a myth or even a legend. We've talked in previous sermons already. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about the two creation stories in Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2. And I mentioned how the first 11 chapters of Genesis really are mythological in nature, that that is not actually the way things unfolded, but these are stories told from an ancient perspective 3,000 years ago, trying to explain what is the reality they see now, how did we get to this place, and that story is told. In a similar way, that was what would be happening here. The writers of the Hebrew Bible are trying to tell the people of the kingdom of Israel, here is how we got here. But here, they're also telling the story using their ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. See, here's the thing. 
Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob lived about 4,000 years ago, and it's really, really difficult to find any archaeological evidence that such individuals lived, let alone having conversations like these. Now, that doesn't mean it didn't happen or that they didn't exist, but we're just simply saying it is difficult to find that. 4,000 years ago, we can tell that this nation lived here and this people group lived here and this is the language they spoke, these general things, but individual, definitive, historical accounts like this are tremendously hard to come by. But the story would have been told. It would have been told perhaps in a variety of ways and passed on, and now the writers decide to say, all right, let's talk about this. Jacob, in his story, when you look closely at it, has a number of things about it that are really challenging to try to understand as actually having happened. There are some inconsistencies we see that if the story is mythical, doesn't really matter. If it's supposed to be historical, it becomes a bit more challenging. So for example, he's wrestling with the man, and it says that the man, this divine being, this angelic being, whatever, could not prevail against Jacob. Now, Jacob is going to say he saw the face of God. How on earth is it that God or a divine being cannot prevail against a human who is wrestling with him? On top of that, it says that when the man saw that he could not prevail against Jacob, he struck him on the hip and caused it to be dislocated. Now, other translations say something that I think is closer to the Hebrew, that he touched his hip and it was dislocated. So you got this wrestling going on, and the man cannot prevail against Jacob, so all he does is touches his hip, and his hip goes out of joint. It's like, okay, if, if that's all you have to do to cripple a man for the rest of his life, how could you not prevail against him? This is kind of a strange thought. So what, what is the point being made here? And, and there is a whole train of thought behind this thing that we don't have time to get into, but, but we see that. We also see puns all over the place. The name of the river, the Jabbok River, apparently sounds very much like the meaning, the word of, of, of uh, prevail or wrestle or struggle and strive. Um, this whole thing about uh, Jacob's name, which meant deceiver, now being made to be Israel instead. The name Israel means wrestles with God or God wrestler. And yet the man says, your name will be Israel because you have wrestled with both God and humans and have prevailed. So he's wrestled with God and won, but he's wrestled with humans and won. But every way that Jacob wrestles with a human being is in a deceptive way. Is this something to be celebrated? Or is this something to be warned against? And especially since the name Israel doesn't say anything about wrestling with human beings. What it seems is happening here is this story is being told you know, and, and we could give the benefit of the doubt that Jacob was indeed an historical person, but now we're embellishing his story to add this critical moment that establishes the name of Israel, which then not only tells the people of Israel, this is what our ancestor was up to, but look what our ancestor was like and how he needed to change, even though he didn't totally change. After he met with Esau, he still went with deception. Esau said, it's great that we're all together. I'm going to head down south to my land of Seir. Why don't you come and join me? I'll follow you. I'll, I'll come with you. And Jacob goes, no, 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 no. It's okay. Like, I'm going to be going slow because my kids are here and we've got some, you know, you, you just go on ahead and I'll catch up with you. And then Jacob goes this way instead and never follows Esau. He, he lied through his teeth again and just let Esau go home. I think the people of the kingdom of Israel are going to read this story and, and see, okay, this is our ancestry. This is where our name comes from. But what do we see in Jacob that we ought not to follow? We ought not to follow his deceptive ways. And if we're talking about wrestling with God in a positive sense, well, then we need to really take to heart what God said. But if we're seeing wrestling with God in a negative sense, then we ought to be people who give ourselves over to what the Torah says, to what, what God's law says, rather than striving against it. Of course, the kingdom of Israel doesn't get that lesson. And 500 years later, they're taken off into exile because they wrestled with God and didn't pay attention to what God was saying. What do we do with that interpretation? 
it's a little bit harder to find a lesson that we just apply. But we can see that this is part of Jesus' backstory. This is part of what Jesus was born into, the story that was understood by the Jews, by the Israelites, of which Jesus was a part, and who the first disciples were a part, the first Christians. We can see that there is a lens through which the scriptures can be in, uh, uh, understood that allows us to see what Israel was up to, how they're trying to understand who they are, and how they understand God is to be, and seek to find a way that matches the pattern of what Jesus will ultimately tell us about how it is that we ought to live. There's so much more I could say about that. Maybe we can discuss it downstairs at coffee time when we have a chance to discuss the sermon. But let me just close with this observation, and I know I've been talking for a while. <laughs> All three of these interpretations are Christian interpretations. All three of these interpretations are held by Christians, people who are wanting to take the book seriously, who recognize that this is a book that has an authority for us in some way, that we look at it every week, we want to learn from it, we want to handle it correctly, we want to understand what it is saying to us. All three of these interpretations are Christian interpretations. Now, you've probably already picked your favorite one, and that's great. And if you have difficulty with one of the others, maybe it's too simple or it's too complex or whatever, okay, fair enough. But your brothers and sisters, not only in this parish, but in other churches, you will find will handle the scriptures in different ways. And we need to make room for that diversity in understanding the scriptures. Let's let that diversity not be an occasion for argument, but for discussion, for exploration, for seeking to understand more. Let us not be in a hurry to label people, whether as heretics or superstitious people or whatever, but let us see that we are together endeavoring to use the book well because this is the book that tells us about Jesus and Jesus is the one we endeavor to follow. So with that, I will finally close and invite you to ponder those thoughts. Amen.